NG. So, lecture two. So let's have a motivating example and start to think about what we're trying to do in this data science dash machine learning. So last time we had some sort of housekeeping, etc. But now we want to actually start doing something. So here's a really simple example that you'll find in James's book, The Introduction. So the goal is we want to predict sales by looking at the amount spent on advertising on TV, radio, and newspaper. So you've got a company that come to you, they say, we spend this money on these various things. Where should we put our money? We want to increase our sales as best we can, so how do we do it? So we've got some R code. So I'm going to put R code as we go along just to remind people if they're not used to it. Remember, I'm expecting you to understand Tidyverse. So if you don't know Tidyverse, you need to go and learn it. So first of all, we're going to read in this data, which is called advertising CSV in my folder. And then what I'm doing, I'm taking the advertising. Remember, this is the migrate R. You read it as then. So I take this data frame. Then I rename the column called X1 to be called ID. So that's just changed the column name. And then I've just hit advertise and it spit this out. This, remember, is a tibble. Tibble is the modern version of a data frame. The nice things about it is, first of all, when you, you give it, it won't give every single row. It summarizes a little bit and it will tell you what R thinks each column is. So in this case, it believes each column is a numeric. Also, automatically gives you size. So I've got 200 observations with five variables. So next thing I do, I take my data, I spit it in the long form using gather, I then do a ggplot, I pass it straight into a ggplot. Remember, once again, to ggplot, I lose my grade and get plus. So my x-axis is going to be amount. My y-axis is the sales. I put some points on there. I've wrapped them, so I've got facets, one for each individual thing I can spend money on. And I've added just a linear model using Geom Smooth. OK. What do you see? Statisticians now, if you see a scatter plot, you should start describing it. Never seen a scatter plot before, John. Don't we do it? That's really hardcore. You're going to be fucked in the exam if you can't do this bit. So, first of all, positive or negative relationship? Positive. Yes. What does that mean? That means as the amount goes, advertising goes up, sales goes up. Does it pass the stupidity test? Is that what you expected? Yeah. These are not trick questions, Anthony. Trick questions are in the meeting later today when I go, why didn't you do any fucking work? <laughs> Do you think it's a linear or non-linear relationship? <laughs> Honestly, it's a bit hard to say. This has got a very poor relationship, hasn't it? You see there's a lot of scatter. It says there is some sort of relationship, but it's hard to pick up. This is getting better. We seem to have some sort of truncation at the top. And we, in, we seem to have an increased variance as we go. Instantly, you're thinking about these things because you're thinking about how you're actually going to model this. If you're going to do something as simple as linear modeling, and most of it will go back to linear modeling to start off with, you need to take that into account. This one, again, I think you've got some curvature, and you've definitely got heteroskelasticity. So you've got the idea that as you increase, the amount of variability increases as well. OK? But generally, this seems to be a positive relationship. So let's get some notation, some ideas. So the sales in this case is a thing we're trying to predict. And you will find it called in different textbooks, I have the response variable, the output variable, especially in machine learning. You also see it called the dependent variable. And most of the time, we will refer to that with the uppercase Y. So that's the thing that we're trying to predict in this case. The variables TV, radio, newspaper, you could call the input variable. You could call it the predictor variable. You can call it the independent variable. A lot of the time in machine learning, you hear it called a feature. And very much you'll hear people talk about feature selection or what are the features in your machine learning. It's basically your predictor variable. And we're going to denote that by x, where x is a variable that consists of x1 up to xp. So we've got p predictors. And what we're trying to achieve is we're going to assume that there is some model out there, f of x. And we're going to say our y is equal to our function of x. It doesn't have to be linear. It can be nonlinear. Plus some noise term. 
and we're going to make some assumptions. We're going to say that fixed is, f is fixed but an unknown function and e is a random error term. We will often assume that the random error term has a expectation of zero. And we'll also assume that it's conditionally independent, or is, sorry, so it's not conditioning, it is independent of f of x. So this thing and this thing are independent. So why do we want to know f? What is the idea? There's two key reasons you will try and estimate f and use f. There's actually three, and I'll talk about the third one in a second. But the two main ones are, you either want to do prediction or inference. And this is the first time. You might sort of say, well, we're doing machine learning. Obviously, there's the right machine learning method. Teach us that, Jono. We can have a really short course. We get it over and done with a week. And the next 11 weeks, we're just going to sit around and drink coffee. Why is there not one? You know, it's, just, it's a good question. Why is there not one? Well, because the problem is the machine method you're going to use depends on what's your question, what's your data, what you're trying to model. And as we go through today's lecture and then the rest of the course, we'll see that you have to think to yourself, what am I trying to achieve? And the first one we're talking about is the model you use often depends on, are you interested in prediction or inference? By inference, I mean explanation. So often when you look at your models, the question is, do you want to use your model to predict or do you want to use your model to explain? Because sometimes models won't do both at the same time. Um, if you want to follow this up, there's a really nice paper um, by Shumeli called To Explain or To Predict. It's a classic text. You'll see this today. And she argues in this that basically you need to think about what your question is before you choose your model. I had a classic example. I once did support vector machines on some genetic data. And it was really good. It predicted really well. And at the end, the collaborator said, so which part of the genome best indicates whether it's a step or forest bison. And I could go, I don't know. No, what do you mean I don't know? I said, that's not how support vector machines work. They will predict, but they won't explain. And they went, oh, so we went and did logistic regression. In this paper, she argues that there's basically three things used in the model. Models are used to explain the relationships. They're used to predict new observations. She also has one there just for general description. Some models there are just for description, which in my mind is always very similar to the explain, but she calls it separately. So let's talk about prediction. So what we're trying to do with prediction, what we're going to say is we want to predict a new observation, which will indicate by y hat, and we're going to basically estimate f from some sort of data or training data set, and then we can predict our y hat. And in this case, our f dash of x is just a black box. You put in x and out spits y hat. And that's it. That's in prediction. And you can break this down. You say, well, is it any good? So you can say, well, what's the expected squared distance between my true value of y and my estimated value of y? And this can be, you can show this to do, as long as you assume that f hat and x are fixed, then you can actually break this down into this bit, which is the difference between, remember, we don't know f of x. We've guessed f of x. The hat goes, it's a guess. So you have the difference between what you guessed and the truth. And obviously, this is reducible. What that means is by choosing your model, you may be able to reduce that down. But at the same time, there's always going to be noise in your system. There's that epsilon, the irreducible error. Your model can only get so good. Even if you had a perfect model, there will always be that noise in the system. Um, if you want to play actually proving that, please have a go. In a short while, we're going to look at a bigger form in the bias variance, and you'll get to have a really good go with that because it's an assignment question. What about inference? What about explanation? Well, now. We don't just want to predict, we want, we're interested in the relationship between x and y. So standard questions, which predictors are associated with the response? We've done this before, we saw it before. With sales, is it radio, TV, which is the best one that's associated with increasing sales? What's the relationship between each of the predictors? So we already said, you know, was it linear, nonlinear? 
can I just keep adding advertisement? My sales will go up, or does it have a cap? It's a non-linear relationship. You know, and could we have a linear equation, or maybe we need something a bit more complicated? And by the fact you're all in this room and you're honest, you really want something a bit more complicated, don't you? It'll all end up being linear regression anyway, so sorry to spoil the fun, but. So how do we estimate F? Well, let's set up some notation again. We're gonna assume that we have some sort of training data. We've got N observations of training data. And what we do is we use the notation that X I J is the value of the data predictor on the i observation. So your data is going to look something like this. There will be a load of features for the first observation plus your response variable, a load of features for your second, response variable, etc. I remember x1 here could be a vector of predictors. So for that first observation, your y would be how much sales, and you'd have how much did you spend on TV, how much did you spend on radio, etc. So let's think again how we can split this. So we've already sort of looked at our machine learning and said, well, is it for prediction or explanation? Next thing you can ask yourself is, is it a parametric method or a non-parametric method? So what do we mean by that? You hear this thrown around already. You know that the t-test is a parametric method. You know the kruskal wallace is a non-parametric. What does that actually mean? Well, the idea of the parametric method is we're going to assume some sort of functional form of f. So you might, the classic one is, in this case, is it's a linear relationship. You're saying there is a, that your value of f of x is going to be a linear combination of your features, your predictors. And what we have is some coefficients that describe that relationship. So we're now going to use our training data to, to fit train the model. And the standard one is we'd use the least squares. Okay. So here you are. Here's my parametric method where we've got TV on the X, sales on the Y. So I took the advertising. I've done a GG plot again. The first variable is what's on my X axis, TV. Sales is my Y axis. I added my points. And then I've quickly fitted using GOM Smooth and ggplot2 a linear model. But it's not a simple linear model because I passed in the formula and said what I want is a quadratic. So you can see you've got a quadratic there and it fits reasonably well. So that's an example of a parametric method. What about a non-parametric method? In this case, we just don't make that assumption about a functional form. We're just going to have a thing that's sort of made up of bits you're going to piece together. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find an estimate of f that is as close to the data as possible without being too wiggly. Now, I know you look at wiggly and go, that's a John O made up word. It isn't this time. This was directly from James. They used the phrase wiggly. So it wasn't just me. So here's a classic example. You might have already seen this before. Here's a non-parametric. I take my advertising data. I produce a plot. Same X, TV, same Y, sales. I add my points. And then I'm doing the default one of G on smooth. So if you ever use G on smooth and you get that wiggly line, what it's fitting is a thing called a Lois. And we'll discuss Lois later in this course. But basically, it's taking each little bit and it's sort of fitting a bit of a linear model and then it's stitching them together. And you end up with something that's fitting the data. Just It's not assuming an overall model, it's just fitting it piecewise and stitching it. And it has a parameter called span, which is roughly the size of the window that you're using to fit each one. And you can see that if I have my span of one, this is fitting the data and it looks very similar to the parametric form, but it's not assuming any parametric, it's just sort of saying, let's model this, let's model this, let's model this, let's model, and let's stitch it together. That is not too wiggly. If I set my span of point 0.1, now it's taking small bits and fitting it together, and you can now see it's very wiggly. So that's a non-parametric. Very nice for seeing the relationships. But again, it doesn't give you much explanation. Great sort of almost prediction, not good explanation. So you're starting to see that, that trade-off, and you'll see that we have a lot of trade-offs. So the first trade-off we're going to talk about is the difference between prediction accuracy and model interpreted interpret that word there. <laughs> we won't. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll deem to not say that out loud. We'll just look at it and nod and go, yes, that's the word. Because you'll find that 
as I said before, certain machine learning things are really, really flexible. They will fit your data. However ugly your relationship, they will get it. But they become really hard to interpret. They become really hard to say, what is the relationship? What does that mean? I mean, we've all, hopefully at some point, fitted a linear regression. And then we fit a linear regression with some interaction terms. And you've noticed, if you've ever done it before, if someone then says, if this coefficient increases by one, how does it change the response variable? And you get a couple of interactions in there and it suddenly becomes very difficult because you've got this all, so it's very hard to have that nice, crisp, clean. If you increase the coefficient by one, then on average, the response variable increases by this. So you find that as we go towards the less flexible models, the lasso, et cetera, which we'll cover, you find they're really nice to interpret. They have constraints, they reduce the amount of coefficients. It's very easy to get that output and talk to your collaborator and say, look, if you increase TV sales by $1,000, you will see this response on average. But they're not as good as predicting. While at this end, you can get models that are really, really good at predicting, but you, they're really hard to interpret. The classic is deep learning. Deep learning will outperform anything you've got when it comes to prediction. But if you then go back and say, excellent, you can predict this will happen. Can you tell me which feature, if I increase or decrease it, how does that have effect? You just go, no, sorry, ain't gonna happen. So that's the first trade-off we've got. It can be really flexible, really good, hard to interpret, or unflexible, but nice and easy to interpret. And you have to have the conversation with your collaborators, the people with the data and the questions, and say, what is it you want? The next split we're going to have is between supervised and unsupervised learning. So everything we've done so far has been what we call supervised. I have a training date to set, I have a load of features, and I have a response variable. And the thing I'm trying to do is elicit a relationship between the response variable and the features. Some data is not like that. Some data, all you get are the feature variables. You don't get a response variable. And what we're trying to do in unsupervised learning is to say, is there some sort of pattern? A lot of the stuff we do there is what we call PCA, principal component analysis, or clustering. It's like you've got this big cluster of data and you're trying to say, is there some sort of pattern in there? Not a pattern that I can label at all, but some sort of pattern. So let's give you an example. You know how up until this point, everything's been about the FVC data set? Who knows the FVC data set? Everyone's had a go. We've all had our 12-year-old boys and looked at their size and their lungs and said, that's fascinating. Welcome to the next generation of FVC data sets. In the 1930s, Fisher, God bless his Nazi soul, looked at irises. <laughs> Oh, no, seriously, you want, you're going to have a look at Fisher. He's a proper Nazi, not a faff around Hitler, quite casual, but a proper Nazi. So, oh, God, yeah, he was the proper eugenics type. Yeah. Okay. Stop common folks like me for breeding. I mean, he was right. I mean, look at me. But um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. He absolutely tried to sway people that the reason <laughs> that people got cancer when they smoked is that common people smoke, and common people have bad genetics, so they're more likely to get cancer. He said the common response is just, Junk DNA. He was being paid by the cigarette companies to do that research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he did smoke a pipe almost continuously. Yeah. I think there's a picture of him asleep with a pipe in his mouth. How did he die though? Fun? How did he die? He died um, at Adelaide. Remember, he was a professor here. He died at the RAH when he was having a tonsillectomy. He died from problems there. He got um, uh, Golden Staff. He Did he? Golden Staff infection. Yeah. Mm. That's so, yeah. a common Which, uh, bacteria. Which is it? famous for Golden Staff infections, apparently. Yeah. So. There's graves in Adelaide if people want to go check it out for some morbid reason. Yeah, it is. Um, we had a famous statistician come and he was doing a talk here. And the first thing he did is he went, oh, it was Davidson. Can I just pop to the cathedral? And I'm like, why? He goes, I want to see Fisher's grave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So the Iris data set is an absolute classic. So what he did is he, the iris was a type of flower, and there was so many species, and for each species he took a samples, and he measured the, now these are petal, you obviously know, 
So you look at the average petal width and length. But the sepal is actually, I'll get this wrong, it's the male part of the flower. And you would look at that. I want to say is, could you use this information to work out which, you know, is the relationship between these measurements and the species? So it's actually a supervised data set, but people still use it for a standard, let's assume you didn't know the species, what's the patterns there? So if you think about it, what we really have, if you ignore that, is we have some sort of four-dimensional space for each observation. And what you could do is you could go and you could plot each observation, each flower, as a point in four-dimensional space. And the question you want to do then is go, is there some sort of cluster in four-dimensional space? Now, unfortunately, you humans are not really good at looking in four-dimensional space. I don't know, you must be bred wrong, unlike as non-humans. We're too common. Yes, that's what I'm going to use the word. Too yeah. common. Yeah. Too common. So what does principal component do? And we will go into a lot more detail of principal components later in this course. But basically, it sort of takes four-dimensional space and it sort of shifts everything around to go, actually, if you look at it in this direction, you can see the clusters. Basically, you can take four-dimensional space and reduce it down to the interesting equivalent in two-dimensional space. How do you do it? Here's our command. We're going to take our iris underscore PC to let me know it's principal component. We're going to do print comp built in. The tilde says I'm going to take everything I've got, but I'm going to remove species. So it's basically saying take this data set. So you do your PCA. Data is iris. We're going to do correlation. There's two ways to do PCA. We're going to do it on a correlation matrix. Then I take this and I'm going to take my iris and I'm going to add a new column called PC1, which is the first principal component which I get from that object, and PC2, second principal components from that object. So there we are, there's the first two principal components. And hopefully what you see now is that we start to see two clusters. In that four dimensional space, if you rotate it and do it the right way, you see some clustering. You've got a cluster over here and a cluster over here. And this is the key idea of unsupervised learning. You've got your data, and you're starting to say, maybe there's some structure there. Now, we cheated. We have the truth, don't we? Let's have a quick look at the truth, see what it does. Well, interestingly, you do find that the clustering actually is associated with the species. This cluster over here are your species uh, Virginica and Versicola, and over here is Setosa. So it did actually work in this case. And often we will do that. We'll take the data, we'll split it. We will also cheat. We will also use PCA as a dimension reduction later on to do what we call PC regression or principal component. So you've got these too many features, you reduce it down to principal components and then use them as your features. Think of it as like a, a data manipulation. So we've got flexibility versus the ability to interpret it. We've also got things like supervised versus unsupervised. Let's have another look at one. The other classic way we classify our machine learning is, is it a regression problem or a classification problem? So the whole idea is now we've got supervised learning and if our response variable is quantitative, that is it's a number, we often call that a regression model. We might not be doing regression, but a lot of the things are developed from your standard linear regression. If what we're trying to do instead is we have a qualitative response, so we've got a categorical variable as our response variable, then that's going to come under the idea of classification. So at this point, the main one you've probably seen for classification is logistic regression, which we will recap later on. But we'll also be looking at things like LDA, QDA, naive Bayes as different ways of classification. So we've got these different sorts of models. And the first thing we should ask is, is it any good? Can we, how can we assess our model accuracy? Okay, so we'll start with the regression setting because that's what you've probably seen before. We're going to define a thing called the mean square error. And what the mean square error is going to be is we're going to take each observation and we're going to take off what our model predicts for that observation. So we've taken our training set, we've fitted it, we take the response minus what's predicted. We square them all and we basically take the mean of that. 
So you're just looking at this idea that maybe your model is slightly less or slightly more. It doesn't matter by squaring it. We make them all into a positive number and then we add up. So it's the average square distance between the truth and what you predict. But we're going to talk about, I could take my data and I could fit this and we're going to call that the training MSE. So you've got your data, you use it to train the model and then you go, well, how well does it fit? And in a second, we'll talk about why that's a bit of a concern. That's going to be your training MSE. It's the MSE calculated by using the model, the data used to train the model to predict the data used to train the model. Make sense? Of course it didn't. <laughs> the problem is, we don't really care about that. We've got the training data. We know the truth. I can go and look in the data frame. The whole idea of this is to develop a model that's going to be good for new data. You know, if the collaborator says, I really want you to develop a model to predict this data exactly, I would write a function that would just return the response variable. It'd be fucking awesome. Okay, what's the mean square? It's zero. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And it's all a one. Yeah, fantastic. Fast as. But that's not what we care about. We're trying to, the idea is we took some data as a representation of the data out there, and we're trying to develop a model that can be used on the data out there. So what we'd really like to do is we'd like to know how good is it for new data. Imagine I've got a new data x0, and it has an associated value y0. And I want to know that my predicted value, using my training data, would be approximately equal to y0. In fact, I'd like to get the mean square of the test, which is the average of the difference between what my model will predict and the truth on that squared distance. So why do we care about test MSC? So let's have a, an illustrative example. So what I've got here is I've got some data produced with a known function. I've simulated this data. So here's my observed points. And first of all, I could fit a straight line. I fit a straight line to this data, and there it is. And instantly, you can look at it and go, it's not very good. Hopefully, you can say it's not very good. If you're a little bit worried and think that's a really good fit, maybe this other course isn't quite the right one for you. Maybe you need something with more stat, prac, and one in it. <laughs> but you can see that's not very good. So you might go, well, let's start getting a better model. And you go, right, I'm going to try non-parametric, and I'm start going to just make it more and more wiggly. So the blue one seems to be looking better, but the green one's absolutely knocking it out of the park. It's very wiggly, but if you look at the predicted line and them dots, it's hitting them nearly every single time. It's doing a really good job. The only reason I didn't go high with the lowest is the computer basically gave up. It couldn't fit it because it was fitting it too well. And if you were just wanting to do this data, that green line is really, really good, isn't it? But the problem is the truth gets in the way. That black line is actually the true underlying function. That is the f of x. And the problem you see here is that actually the blue is not too bad. The green is missing this line, the red misses line. If you just use the green, which would have a great training MSE, you're not going to get to the true model. You're going to get to a model that explains this data but isn't getting the truth in the future. In fact, what I've done here is I've fitted different lowest. As we go from left to right in this case, I'm becoming more and more wiggly. This is actually the expected number of parameters or the equivalent number of parameters in a lowest model. So what I've done here is the value of First of all, the train MSE. So let's look at the train. So this is the case where I take my data, I fit a lowest, I go and predict that data, and I look at that mean squared distance. And notice, as it becomes more and more wiggly, I'm absolutely nailing it. My train MSE is going lower and lower and lower. Because as you get more and more wiggly, you're just ending up with a lowest model that's just going, what's your 10th observation? I would predict that the value of the tenth observation is the observation you had. You can actually get your MSE, if your lowest didn't break, down to zero. You know, If I had the infinite number of parameters where this now would be 
for every single point I just predict that point, well, it's not infinite, it's the number of observations, I would have an MSE of zero. Make sense? The problem is what I did is I actually created another data set, the test data set from that same function. And so what I did is I would go and get my training data set, I would fit a Lois of a certain size, I would then take that and go, now predict this little bit of data I set aside as my test. How does it do there? And you can see, first of all, as it gets more complicated, it gets better, but then it starts to get worse. Because after this point, what's happening is the data is becoming pretty well too wiggly. It's overfitting the model. And by overfitting the model, I mean it's basically too wiggly and it starts to predict your data exactly, as opposed to having the ability to predict new data in the future. Okay? So you'll hear a lot about a thing called the bias variance trade off. So let's have a look at that. So, first of all, what we're really interested in is the expected squared distance between a new observation and the predicted observation using some model. And this can be shown to break down into three bits. I'm not going to prove this because you're going to prove this. It's your first assignment question. But what's this? This first one here is how much your fitted model will vary. And I'll explain that in more detail in a second. The second term is how biased is your model? How good is your model at describing that data? Plus, we've got that irreducible error. And this is when people talk about the variance bias trade-off, is that this thing you care about, which you want to minimize, is related to these two things. And these two things are always positive. And you find as you change your models, these will change. And the idea is try and get these as low as possible. And you'll find that generally, as your models become more flexible, this will increase, this will decrease. As the less flexible, the other way around. Remember, we can never get perfection because you'll always have that irreducible error at the end. Okay? So when people talk about the bias variance trade off, that's what they say. They say, when it comes to the measure of your model accuracy, that will always be down to three components. The variance of your model, the bias of your model squared, and that extra irreducible term. And you need to trade off between them. As models become too flexible, they become unbiased, but far too variable, and vice versa. So what do we mean by the variance of f? The variance of f is the amount of f would change if we estimate it with a different data set. So you've got this model, and as you change your data, your model will change. How much does it change? If you change a little bit, does it change a lot or not? That's your variance of that model. Generally, more flexible models have higher variance. What's the bias? It's the expected difference between your model and the truth. An intuitive, if you try to model a complicated model with a simple model, then it is likely to be biased. And again, notice there's not set rules. I've said things like tend to or generally. General rule though, as the flexibility of your model increases and the variance increases and the bias decreases. Okay, so let's illustrate that. So what I've got here is I've got some data. And what I've done is I've simulated from the same model all together 10 times. So the color indicates a simulation. So single underlined function, but each time I've simulated the model with some noise. And for each of those, so you could take, for example, the um, purple dots. You've got these purple dots. I can go and fit a Lois. I fit a Lois for a span of two. And there's your line. And the two is not a very flexible model. It's not too wiggly. First thing to notice is notice how these, even though we have 10 different data sets, are not varying a lot, are they? They're all roughly following the same pattern, but they're all quite biased. They're basically overestimating for this region, they're underestimating from this region. They're not getting the truth very well. So this is an example where you have a low flexibility model, has low variance, high bias. 
Yep. So now I've got this model. Exactly the same data set, simulated, well, same function, simulated 10 times. For each one, I took the data, I fit a lowest. I'm not doing lowest of 0.1. First of all, let's look at the bias. Generally, these models seem to be, you know, if you screen your eyes, fitting the data really well. They have a low bias. But look at the different lines. Each line is really variable. I mean, if we go back, that's your rough amount of variability. You suddenly come here, and this is the sort of amount of variability you're getting. There's a rough, so you get that idea that as your model becomes more flexible, the variability goes up. It becomes so sensitive to your data. As soon as you change the data, it's like, bang, here's a new model. Well, the one doesn't have that, but the bias, the ability to cope with any model becomes better and better. What about classification case? Well, now what we're going to do, instead of looking at the distance between your response and your predict and looking at the square, now we're just going to have classification error. So we're going to define that now as you basically count up the number of mistakes. So the i is your indicator function. And in this case, it will be 1 if your yi, your true value, is not equal to your predicted value, and 0 if not. So we've got this symbol, what they call sometimes a 0, 1 cost. You make a mistake, it costs one. You don't make a mistake, it's zero. And we're just taking the mean of that. In that case, there's actually a nice idea, I think, called the Bayes classifier. And the idea is, if you're going to look at that test error rate, the best you can do is what we call a Bayes classifier. And what the Bayes classifier says is that we're going to allocate observation y to class j, given the predict x0 where you calculate this for each possible class, and you find the largest one. So you say, what's the probability it's class 1, given the data? What's the possibility it's class 2, given the data? You calculate all them probabilities for each class, and then you assign whichever probability is the highest. If you did that, you can't do better. That is your best scenario. The problem is, it assumes I know this relationship. It says I have the ability to calculate the probability of each class given a predictor. It's assuming you pretty well know the model or you know the distribution, which we don't have. So let's have a look at one way of getting around that as an example of a first model you've probably not seen before, which is the K nearest neighbor. So, as I said, if we knew this conditional distribution, that is the probability of our response variable being in class J, given our features, if we knew that, then we could get the best possible model, the best possible predictor. Instead, we're going to do what we call k-nearest neighbor. And what k-nearest neighbor does is it tries to basically estimate that conditional distribution. So what it does, it takes your x0, your feature value of your thing you want to predict. And then you go to your training data set and you find a neighborhood. You say, find all the points that are close to this. Usually the close to this is usually done on a Euclidean distance. So the K will be how many points? So if it was a 10 nearest neighbor, you go to 10 nearest points to that. And then what you do is you say, what we'll do for each possible class, will basically work out how many of the points are that class. So you go to your neighbor, you've got 10 points, and let's say six of them are class one, then you say the probability of being class one is 0.6. So it's almost like you go and you say, right, I will get that neighborhood, and I will find the most common class, that's what I'm gonna predict. That's how it works in K nearest neighbors. You just, and for each point you want to predict, you go, you find the k nearest neighbors, you go, what's the consensus from them? What's the majority? That's what I will predict. So, oh, it's the Irish data set so quickly. You lucky, lucky buggers. So here's our Iris data set. This time we're gonna have two features, our sepal length, our sepal width, and here is our training data set. Each point is in this space, and I've indicated what species they are. 
So what I've done here is I've made myself a little predictive space. So for every point in this space, and you can see it's actually lots and lots of little dots, that's how I cheated and got it to do this, I basically look at this point and I said, right, what are the 10 nearest observations to this point? What's the consensus? We'll set that prediction to be that. So in this case, it's Virginica. And I did it all the way over. And you get some weird little stuff around here. I don't quite know why, but you know, the code is doing that. It's going to every point and it's looking at it. What I've done as well is I've cut these points so you can see, for example, this point here, when I predict for it, my K nearest neighbor said, honestly, you should be blue. But it's actually a green one, it sticks out. So that's the K nearest. If you think about it, if you set K to be small, you get a very, very flexible model. It gets very, very wiggly. If you do K, you're smoothing out. You're taking more data in to make that decision. K equals 50, and you find that your boundaries become less wiggly, like that. So that's K equals 50. Cool. So, that's an overview of the machine learning and what we're going to do. Friday, we're going to go back and we're going to do a recap of linear regression. I know you've all done it, but it's always nice to sort of stop and think about linear regression and do a recap from there. Then next Wednesday, we'll start doing classification. So, no lecture Monday. There is a lecture this Friday in Ligat 1314. It's not a workshop like it normally will be. You should all have access to Canvas by now. If not, you need to let me know. You should all have signed on to Slack by now. If not, you need to sign on Slack. That's the fastest way to communicate with me. Email is fine, but it won't get checked as often as Slack. Your first assignment is due at Friday, 5 p.m. on week three. So two weeks on Friday, okay? You will need to do the assignment. You've already got the first question you can do. You can start going up. You'll find that the, the back of the assignment, I was talking to some people before, the back of the assignment is a mark scheme which will tell you for each question how many marks, how difficult it is, what the content is, and what sort of thing I'm testing in there. And I'll be giving you individual feedback on your marks so you can see where you're having difficulty or not having difficulty, and I can do the same. Any questions? Am I the only one who doesn't have access to this talk on camera? Have you checked this morning? You don't have access? I have access to Josh's talk. I'll check upon that for you. Okay. Let me put that in my list. Is anyone else who doesn't have access? I know you don't, but that's all right. I'll try anyway. Um, Do you have enough material at this point to keep going, or do you need me to email you stuff? It's on Slack, right? Yeah. I just don't have that assignment on Slack. Okay, I'll make sure you get it. Any other questions? Cool. See you all Friday. Thank you very much.